True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. 17-year-old Carla Homolka met 23-year-old Paul Bernardo in 1987. Some saw their meeting as love at first sight, but the two had a dangerous attraction, which would drive them to commit abductions, sexual assaults, and even murder. This good-looking couple became obsessed with one another, and Paul was very controlling of Carla. But Paul Bernardo's crimes were not all his own. Evidence, including videotapes, would show that Carla was a willing participant, despite her claims that she was just another one of Paul's victims. Join us at the Quiet End for a killer couple, Carla Homolka and Paul Bernardo. The most basic question asked about serial killers is why, and this becomes much more complicated and difficult to answer when murders are committed by more than one person. So today we're analyzing one of the most notorious couples in modern history, What role did Carla play in Paul's violent sex crimes? And how did her gender affect the disparity in their charges and sentencing? Lots to talk about, and Dick is here with a beer from Canada. We have a beautiful Canadian beer today. It's called Equinox du Printemps, which is spring equinox in English. It's uh, from a brewery in Montreal, and the beer is a Scotch ale. Very nice. 9.5% alcohol by volume. It's a dark brown, almost black color, a light tan head, a little bit of lacing, very beautiful sweet malt aroma, toffee taste, maple syrup in the taste. And this beer turned out to me to be just sweet enough without being too sweet. And the alcohol is very well hidden in all that sweetness. So you got to be careful with this one. So grab a beer or two. Let's head on down. Okay, well, let's open it up first. All right, I've got my TCB snifter. Let's go down to the quiet end. And here we are. It's not very far, is it? No, it's an easy trip. Yeah. Okay, so this case has been recommended many, many times over the past eight years that we've been doing this show, and it has been covered quite a bit in the true crime community. But we're having some kind of concentration on psychology, the trial, the sentencing, and a lot to do with that. Also, a trigger warning for rape. And also this case has a lot of abuse against young teens, so it is a difficult one to listen to. So why don't you go ahead and start us out on this story, Dick? It's difficult, but it is fascinating. It is. All right, so first, though, before we really get too deep into this, let's get to know our two murderers who are responsible for the terrible deaths of three teenage girls, and that's among other things. Right, yeah. So Carla Leanne Homolka was born May 4th, 1970. Her parents moved to St. Catharines in 1974. Their house was in a nice middle-class suburban neighborhood. Carl, Carla's father, was a Czech immigrant. He was a salesman, so he was often traveling for work. He was a small guy, about 5'7". Carla's mother, Dorothy, was a friendly, plumpish woman who worked at St. Catharines Shaver Hospital. So Carla grew up with two younger sisters. Tammy was five years younger than Carla, and Lisa was just one year younger. So Tammy's the baby of the bunch. All three of the girls were pretty and quite vivacious. Tammy was the most athletic of the bunch. In the backyard of their split-level house, the family had a swimming pool. Over the years, Carla and her friends spent much of their summers there. Dorothy was always a welcoming presence, making snacks and mini pizzas for the kids to eat. Loud and stubborn, Carla was never afraid to argue with her parents or to speak her mind. Arguments about chores or homework sometimes ended with Carla screaming and slamming doors. But her parents seemed to be used to this behavior. They just let her cool off. From a young age, Carla hated to admit when she was wrong about anything. But in school, she wasn't a troublemaker. She was friendly to everyone and was never a bully. One gift that she had was that she really didn't care what anyone thought about her. 
many of her girlfriends envied that in her. I envy that part because I'm always worried about what people think when I don't want to be. I think it is really a gift to not care. I'm not sure it's even possible when you're a teen. I don't know. And it might be part of the fact that she was a psychopath or sociopath that made it easier for her. But we're going to delve into that. Absolutely. So over the summer between grades 7 and 8, her last year of elementary school, Carla dyed her hair from blonde to brunette. So this was a dramatic change. But it was not the last time Carla would show her independence through coloring her hair. In high school, she had an almost weekly change of color. Now her parents did tolerate her mood swings and her rebellion, maybe because she was academically competitive and she got good grades at school. Even during the summer, Carla would read novels and write her own short stories. In high school, Carla began to show an interest in boys, and she would suggest to her friends that they go for walks around the neighborhood after school and kind of scope out cute guys. So as the girls would wander the quiet residential streets, Carla was the only one who was brave enough to wave at cars with attractive drivers or passengers. And sometimes the cars would stop. And on those occasions, the girls would try and act older. But it was Carla who seemed quite comfortable chatting with these strangers, and she did most of the talking. Carla was the first in her group to try drugs and the first to have sex. She was basically up for anything. Some of her friends felt like she didn't respect herself enough and that she really was putting herself in dangerous situations. Carla had once been determined to become a police officer and then a veterinarian. Her first real job was when she was 16 at the Penn Center Shopping Mall Pet Store, which was just a short walk from her school. So she began spending the after-school hours and weekends in the store. Her job included feeding and watering the animals, and she soon began to take her work home with her. Along with the gray, black, and orange striped tabby cat that she named Shadow, Carla had several pet rats, some hamsters, and two rabbits. In the 12th grade, Carla and her friends were thinking about college, and Carla thought about going to the University of Gulf to study veterinary science. So in late September, Carla, her co-worker Debbie, and the store manager Christy went to Toronto for a pet store supplier's convention. Debbie and Carla took the bus and stayed in a hotel room all on their own, so this was very exciting for them. It was their first real taste of freedom. And it was during this trip that Carla met Paul Bernardo. So a little bit about Paul. He was born on August 27, 1964, to Marilyn and Ken Bernardo, and he had two older siblings. David was born in 1962, followed by Debbie in 1963. So they were just born boom, 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 one right after the other. Three kids in two years. Pretty much, yeah. So Ken became an accountant the same year that Paul was born and both Marilyn and Ken stayed in close contact with their parents. So they would drive to where the parents lived in Kitchener for visits. And sometimes, if Ken stayed behind for work, Marilyn traveled to Kitchener alone to visit her parents. And a few times, she ran into an old boyfriend who she'd broken up with to be with Ken. He didn't seem like he was going anywhere, and Ken seemed like he'd be a better provider. So she'd ended up leaving this guy for Ken. But since their breakup, this guy had done really well in business and was actually becoming a wealthy man. So I think she kind of regretted that choice as time went on. Although Ken did fine. Yeah, he wasn't starving. Nobody was starving. No, far from it. He had a decent job. So is there any indication that she became more than friends with the old flame? Oh, absolutely there is. And we will get to that. A lot more than friends. It was in 1965 when Marilyn and Ken bought a house in a subdivision of Scarborough. They looked like they were on their way to achieving the American dream. Ken was doing well at work and drove a nice car. Within a few years, he'd have a company car. So each day, Ken went back and forth to work dressed immaculately in a suit, a press shirt, and a tie. Not one hair on his head was ever out of place. He even wore a dress shirt to cut the lawn. The Bernardos were the first family on their block to install their own pool. So while Ken worked, Marilyn did the laundry, cleaning, and cooking. The kids were always well-dressed and clean, and it was easy to look at the well-kept lawn, Ken in his suit, and Paul's cherubic smiling face and believe, hey, these Bernardos really have it all. But inside of the Bernardo home, 
There was really a strange family life that very few outsiders would ever see. They weren't very friendly, and some women tried to befriend Marilyn, and they might be invited over for a cup of tea, but there was never any real socializing as a couple. The women on the street didn't warm up to Ken, who they said had a cold stare and rarely spoke with them. He wouldn't even give them a smile. As odd as Marilyn seemed to be, she seemed harmless. But Ken always made them feel uncomfortable, and no one knew exactly what it was about him that just didn't seem right. But in contrast to Ken's tidiness, Marilyn was a complete mess. Her daily outfit was worn t-shirts and baggy shorts. And as she put on more and more weight over the years, she would just wear an oversized house dress. Marilyn acted as if being a housewife made her inferior to her husband, and she believed it was her duty to stay home with the kids, and she felt guilty about spending money on anything but the bare necessities. So at Christmas, there were no Christmas lights on the Bernardo home, and the gifts that the Bernardo kids received were just practical items like sweaters, socks, and winter coats. Not any toys. And so while Marilyn and Ken kept to themselves, their youngest child, Paul, spent as little time at home as possible. He bonded early with two neighborhood boys, the Smyrnas brothers. Paul, poking his head over the fence, taunted young Van Smyrnas. Fatty, fatty, two by eight, can't get through the garden gate. Paul teased the kid that way. And his taunts hurt Van's feelings because Van was very self-conscious about his pudginess and he often felt like crying. He would never have predicted that Paul, the bully, would one day become his best friend. Yeah, and he really did. The bond between Van and Steve Smyrnas and Paul got stronger as they reached school age. Steve and Paul started school together. Because of his large build, Van was always the same size as the two older boys. The boys socialized back and forth between their two yards and houses, playing war games, hide-and-seek, and tag, Paul was always at the Smyrna's home rather than the other way around, though. When Van did go inside the mostly off-limits Bernardo home, he found it to be cold and uncomfortable. Paul received very little attention or affection at home. And Van didn't see any of them hug or say, I love you, when Paul left the house to play or to go to school. Van and Steve's parents, Bill and Gina, really felt sorry for Paul and they were perfectly happy to have him play at their house or sleep there overnight with Steve and Van and their little baby brother, Alex. All three of their boys enjoyed having Paul around. By the time they were in their mid-thirties, Marilyn and Ken's sex life was over. Their double bed in the master bedroom was replaced by two single beds, and later Marilyn would sleep in the basement, leaving Ken alone in the upstairs bedroom. She admitted openly to one friend that she and Ken did not have a good sex life. They didn't have any. People living on the street couldn't remember Ken and Marilyn showing any affection toward each other. But on the other hand, they never put each other down. It was like two dysfunctional people without confidence were trapped in a marriage together. A life for the three kids appeared to go on as normal. Apart from the occasional hockey game, Paul, who was the smallest boy on the block, wasn't interested in sports. David, the oldest, had difficulty in school, but Paul and his sister Debbie excelled. Steve, Van, and Paul became best friends, walking to and from school together and running cross-country. Van and Paul earned bronze swimming medals at the high school pool. Paul also joined the Boy Scouts with Steve and Van at age 11 or 12. And while a scout, he won the Chief Scout Award. As part of their scouting, they put in 120 hours, about five days' worth of volunteer work at the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto during the summer, pushing seniors around in their wheelchairs and taking the elderly to the displays and events. In scouting, as in most of life, Paul was always imaginative and fun. Yeah, and all throughout school, Paul did get good grades and worked a lot. He brought Van and Steve into some of his get-rich-quick schemes while he worked in restaurants for extra cash as well. Despite his lack of athletic skill, many of the girls had a crush on Paul, and Paul fell hard for several pretty girls. His first love was Nadine Brammer, an attractive blonde who most students felt could have almost any guy she wanted. Nadine shared an apartment with her older sister, and Van was there the night Paul and Nadine had sex for probably their first time. Soon after this, Paul and Nadine were boyfriend and girlfriend. Paul bought her red roses and diamond earrings, and she would say as far as sex was concerned, Paul was kind and gentle. 
which is interesting because we'll find out later on he was anything but that. Yes. He's like, what, a senior, 17, 18 years old at this stage? Mm-hmm. And this was his first love? His first love. And this love affair with Nadine lasted about a year. Paul's jobs and his efforts to get good grades in school didn't give Paul much time to do chores around the house, though. And after his 16th birthday, Paul and his mother were getting into regular shouting matches, and then Marilyn would yell at Paul for his lack of consideration. Paul would usually just tell his mom to get lost. Then one day, Marilyn lost her temper and shouted at Paul, You're just a bastard. Do you really think Ken's your real father? He doesn't even look like you. And then she showed Paul a photo of her old boyfriend from Kitchener and told him this is your real father. So this was a big shock, as you can imagine. No kidding. I mean, he's a teenager now. Yep. And Ken already knew this, but it was very upsetting for Paul. And it does make me think of other serial killers who have had similar situations at home, like uh, Ted Bundy. He thought his mother was his sister. So these can be an issue for some people. After Marilyn and Ken were married, Marilyn explained to Paul she gave birth to David and then Debbie. But then in the early 60s, she'd returned to Kitchener and had an affair with her former boyfriend. So Marilyn told Paul that she'd become pregnant, and then Ken had reluctantly taken her and her illegitimate baby back. Marilyn related to Paul how, when he was a small child, she would drive him to Kitchener, saying she was going to visit her sisters. Then after a visit with her sisters, she would take Paul to a McDonald's or another fast food place for a hamburger or a milkshake. And unknown to Paul, his biological father would sit in a booth to get a good look at his son. So after Paul learned that Ken wasn't his father, Paul's relationship with his parents only got worse. Then Ken was caught peeping in neighborhood windows, and he was watching girls get undressed. So it was the summer of 1985 or 1986 when many women and girls heard eerie noises outside their ground floor bedroom windows after dark. One teenage girl saw a silhouette of a man outside of her friend's basement bedroom window, and he was partially hidden by some trees so the girl couldn't give a description of him. On one occasion, a woman and her husband watched Ken cross the street to their lot and walk around in their yard. Also, on many occasions, they had seen footprints outside of their daughter's window. But then when that father confronted Ken, Ken denied the accusation. But then one night around midnight, two teen girls saw Ken come out of his house in his pajamas and go look into a basement window where a young woman had her bedroom. A few minutes later, the girls called the police from a public telephone and gave them the address of the house where they'd seen this happen. And when they returned with the police, Ken was already gone. The homeowners were stunned when told about this peeping Tom and very shocked when they were told it was Ken Bernardo. The couple asked police what could be done, but the police told them that, you know, peeping toms are harmless. Huh. Which is not true, because we know Bundy started out as a peeping tom. It's definitely, it's a red flag. I mean, I certainly wouldn't consider peeping toms harmless. No. Well, even if that's all they're doing, it's an invasion of privacy. Shouldn't be allowed to happen. Yeah. And these were young girls. It wasn't like it was the older women either. Not that that would be better, but you know what I mean. I do. Very disturbing. The thing I'm finding interesting is that this guy is probably in his 40s at least, and it's like all of a sudden he started being a peeping Tom. Oh, I don't think it's all of a sudden. I think it was going on all along. I just think he hadn't been caught yet. I'll go with that. I would think so. I don't think it's something that just pops up when you're an adult. Usually not. Paul became involved in multi-level marketing scams, and he was very involved with Amway. Yeah, I think he used a lot of what he learned through Amway to just charm people and pick up women. So it wasn't just a way to make money, it was a way for him to meet women. I think there's maybe more effective ways to meet women, but that could work. It worked for him. Paul's hero was Jim Baker of the PTL Club. He was a role model. Yeah, another person who sexually assaulted a woman. After high school, Paul began business and commerce studies at the University of Toronto's Scarborough campus. When he graduated from college, he got a job as a junior accountant at Price Waterhouse. It's a nice entry-level job. He and Van would go out and pick up women together, and Paul confided in him that he had a fantasy of having an entire farm of virgins for him to have sex with whenever he wanted. 
Paul confided to Van about many of his sexual fantasies. Van tended to brush most of these off as jokes. And that's a problem because it really wasn't jokes. It was serious stuff he was sharing. Paul did brag later about playing sadomasochistic games with one of his girlfriends. These sexual escapades almost always ended in anal sex. Van had to pull Paul from the top of his girlfriend once because he was punching her in the face in a jealous rage. Yeah, so he became violent at a young age. Yeah, where's this nice tender lover? Yeah, that's way gone. As a young adult, Paul clearly became obsessed with sex, and he talked a lot about raping girls and loving anal sex. So to Paul, it seemed like sex and power really went together. It was October 17, 1987, when Paul and Van went to the Howard Johnson's Hotel Bar in Scarborough to drink and pick up women. And that's where they approached Carla and her friend Debbie, who were there for that pet store convention, remember? Yep. So Carla and Paul were obviously attracted to each other, and Paul aggressively went after her. After drinking together for a couple of hours, Paul invited the girls to their room for a drink, and Carla quickly agreed. Van and Debbie really weren't very attracted to each other, but Carla and Paul were completely caught up in one another. So as Carla opened the hotel room door, the girls walked in first, and Paul whispered to Van, This could get ugly, so don't look. Creepy, huh? Very. Right from the beginning there. So Van wondered what he was talking about. To the left, there was a queen-size bed, and then straight ahead, there was a pull-out sofa. And these two pieces of furniture were only about seven feet apart. Paul immediately pounced on Carla, and the two took the bed. At first, it was too dark for Van and Debbie to see what was going on between Paul and Carla on the bed, but they could hear it. They could hear heavy breathing and movement under the sheets, so they knew what was going on. After his eyes adjusted to the dark, Van saw Carla's naked body moving on top of Paul's body. He could see that her hips were grinding into him and her breasts were hanging in Paul's face. So they were having sex, just feet away from their friends, and it seemed like they didn't even know they were there. It was even shocking to Van, who had been through a lot of crazy things with his friend Paul. But to Debbie, it was very upsetting and shocking. She had no idea that Carla would do anything like this, and of course it was very uncomfortable to be sitting there with a strange man while these two people are having sex. I can imagine. So it was pretty crazy. Then before they left the next morning, Paul got Carla's information and told her he had feelings for her. Late that night, Van tried to call Paul and his phone was busy for hours. Finally, after many attempts, Van reached Paul and Paul told him he'd called Carla and they'd been talking for hours. So that was it. They were a couple after that. Now remember, Carla's only 17. She's still in high school. Paul's 23 at this point. Yeah. Inappropriate for many reasons. So after that trip, Debbie told some of their girlfriends about Carla's physical attachment to the blonde-haired man and her discomfort at being stuck in a hotel room with a strange guy while her friend had sex just a few feet away. Yeah, it's really kind of gross if you think about it. And she just met him. Right. So not only was Carla's behavior rude, but it was also dangerous. She didn't even know Paul for more than a few hours before she had unprotected sex with him, pretty much in front of the other couple. But Paul was all that Carla talked about for the next couple of weeks. And then when Carla told her friends that her new boyfriend was 23 years old, six years older than her, they were stunned. They're wondering why a 23-year-old guy would be interested in dating a high school girl. Yeah, but it's really not surprising once you get to know who Paul is. No, it isn't. No. So weeks passed and Paul's name appeared on Carla's notebooks at school. Occasionally, she'd doodle things like Carla Bernardo and Carla Loves Paul. Paul would sometimes drive down twice in one weekend to see Carla because he wasn't comfortable asking if he could stay over at her parents' house. So he sent flowers and he called her every day. Then he took Carla to expensive, trendy restaurants. Carla's friends, who were still very skeptical of Paul's intentions, had to admit to themselves that it looked like he was treating her like a princess. And clearly, Carla was being swept off her feet by her Prince Charming from Scarborough. 
Eventually, Dorothy and Carl Homolka agreed that it was silly for Paul to be driving back and forth, so he was able to begin sleeping on the upstairs couch. They really liked Paul and trusted him, apparently. And they thought, you know, he might be good for their daughter. But the reality was that when he spent his nights on that couch, he'd get up in the middle of the night and sneak upstairs before her parents woke up. So he was sleeping with Carla for the most part. They were just hiding it. Well, yeah. So Carla changed when she was with Paul. She really cut back on how much she ate and she got very thin. It'll turn out that that's how Paul wanted it. She also grew out her hair long the way he wanted it. Unlike other girls, Carla would do just about anything to please Paul. She encouraged his sadistic sexual behavior and his future acts of violence and rape as well. Paul Bernardo began committing multiple sexual assaults in May of 1997, five months before he met Carla, and this repeat offender would be known as the Scarborough Rapist, and these rapes would escalate in violence over time. So on May 4th, 1987, Paul raped a 21-year-old woman in front of her parents' house after he had stalked her and followed her home. His attack on her lasted for more than half an hour, which I bet feels like a year when you're the victim. Then, just one week after that, he attacked and raped a 19-year-old woman in the backyard of her parents' house, and this attack would last for over an hour. These were brutal. Must have been. Absolutely. Then, on July 27, 1987, Paul attempted to rape a young woman, but this woman was able to fight back, and he did give up and flee the scene. That December, December 16, 1987, Paul committed his third rape against a 15-year-old girl, and the attack lasted about an hour. And the day after this attack, the Toronto police issued a warning to women in Scarborough who were traveling alone at night, especially women or girls who were taking buses. So on December 23, 1997, Bernardo attacked and raped a 17-year-old at knife point. And after this attack, the unknown perpetrator was referred to in the media as the Scarborough Rapist. So we get to, on December 23, 1987, Bernardo attacked and raped a 17-year-old at knife point. And after this attack, the perpetrator was referred to in the media as the Scarborough Rapist. Then, on April 18th of 1988, Bernardo committed his fifth rape. This was on a 17-year-old, and this attack lasted over 45 minutes. Then, May 25th, 1988, Bernardo was almost caught while staking out a bus shelter, and the investigator noticed him hiding beneath a tree and went after him on foot, but unfortunately, he was able to escape again. So, by this time, it had been over a year since the first attack by the Scarborough Rapist. And just five days later, Bernardo attacked an 18-year-old in Clarkson, about 25 miles from Scarborough. And this was another lengthy attack, which included torture and lasted 30 minutes. Then October 4, 1988, Bernardo attempted a seventh rape. His intended victim was able to fight him off and escape after he stabbed her twice. Then one month later, he committed his seventh rape. Between November 16, 1988 and May 1990, the Scarborough Rapist committed eight additional rapes. He was described as a white male in his 20s with blonde hair and blue eyes, kind of like the boy next door. In July 1990, after multiple tips to the police identified Paul Bernardo as someone who would fit the composite sketch, Bernardo was finally interviewed by the police. And between May and September 1990, Police submitted more than 130 suspect samples for DNA testing. After the sketch was released to the media, hundreds of tips came in. Police received at least two reports that the Scarborough rapist was Paul Bernardo. The first call was from a bank employee who was familiar with Bernardo. And the second came from Tina Smyrnas, Alex Smyrnas's wife. Right. Alex was the little brother of Van and Steve He's Smyrnas. the younger brother. Yep. So he'd known him all his life. So Tina told the detectives that Bernardo had been called in on a rape investigation back in December of 1987, but he had never been interviewed. And she said he frequently talked about rough sex and anal sex. So after looking into their files, detectives decided to interview Bernardo. That interview took place on November 20th, 1990, lasted only 35 minutes. 
Before leaving, Bernardo willingly gave samples to be tested for DNA. He admitted that, yeah, he did look like the man in the sketch, but the detectives decided that such a polite, well-educated man with no criminal record couldn't be the Scarborough rapist. Still, his samples were sent in for testing. Back in the day, DNA was still a new tool for investigators, and it was going to take about 18 months before they got results back. Yeah, but I guess they weren't really concerned because they really didn't see him as their suspect. Yeah, he was just too good looking. Yeah, they were just following the rules. So in February of 1991, Paul actually moved to St. Catharines and the Scarborough rapes stopped. Huh. But then on April 6th, he committed what was his at least 12th rape that we know of. And this one was in St. Catharines. And this poor victim was younger than his previous victims. This girl was just 14 years old. And unlike the Scarborough rapes, this one occurred in the early morning, and it was not near a bus stop. So now I think we should probably bring up Jane Doe, because she'll become very important. Yeah, because this is a case that was Carla's idea. And crimes perpetrated on Jane Doe were instigated by Carla. Yeah. So on June 7th, 1991, Carla was working in the pet store, and she befriended a young co-worker. This teen would later be referred to as Jane Doe. So as a minor at the time, her identity has been protected. So Jane first met Carla Hamolka when she was 12 years old. And this is the summer of 1988. The petite and energetic girl loved animals. And after looking at the pets in the number one pet center at the Penn Center shopping mall, Jane and her mother met one of the store employees. That was Carla. Soon, Jane became a regular visitor to the pet store. Once, Carla even took Jane in for a soda in the mall during a break. Jane soon found herself talking about Carla with her mother and occasionally talking with Carla on the telephone. Right, so it was several months later when Carla left the pet store and began working at a veterinary clinic. So contact between Jane and Carla pretty much ended. But then the relationship resumed in early 1991 when Jane was given an invitation to Carla's wedding shower. Fifteen years old at the time, Jane was happy that Carla had remembered her after so much time had gone by. The shower ended up being canceled, much to Jane's disappointment. But Carla called and suggested that the two get together for what she called a girl's night out. So they'd go out for dinner, do some shopping, and then Jane could stay overnight at Carla and Paul's house. So Jane checked with her mother and the sleepover was allowed. The girls had a great time talking about animals and cute boys. It was Friday, June 7, 1991, three weeks before Carla and Paul's wedding. So they talked a lot about wedding plans and how Carla wanted Jane and her mother to be there. When they returned to Carla's house at 57 Bayview, Jane asked if it would be okay if she had a drink. She'd never had alcohol before and she wanted to try it. So Carla told her she could have whatever she wanted, and Jane had some peach schnapps and orange juice that was mixed for her by Carla. The two watched the movie Ghost on the VCR, although Jane would later say she couldn't remember the movie. In fact, Jane couldn't remember much of anything from that night. She didn't even remember waking up the next morning or how she had made it downstairs. She does remember her first meeting with Paul Bernardo, though. He was sitting at the kitchen table having breakfast. When Jane came in, fell to her knees on the kitchen floor and vomited. She was so embarrassed. After cleaning herself up, she went home, and she told her concerned mother that she just had the flu, but in fact, she felt like she was going to die. She'd never felt so sick in all her life. So although both Jane and her mother attended Carla and Paul's wedding on June 29th, Jane was still really embarrassed at how she'd behaved around the older couple, and she actually wrote them a letter of apology. How sad is that? And after that, Jane was a regular weekend visitor to Paul and Carla's home. The three would go out to dinner, watch movies, and sometimes order takeout. And Jane was really excited to get the attention of these older adults. But Jane's mom was really getting concerned. As the relationship intensified, Jane's mother, really unhappy with the age difference between her daughter and the married couple, began to erase messages that were left by Carla on their home answering machine. A trip the three took to Toronto in August 1991, which was just supposed to be a day trip, turned into an overnight when Jane called home to say that Paul had too much to drink to drive her home, 
and that trip really increased the uncomfortable feelings that Mary had about the Bernardos. Yeah, the closer Jane Doe gets to the Bernardos, the more concerned her mother gets. Right. So late that summer, Paul and Carla invited Mary, Jane's mother, to dinner, and they seemed like the perfect hosts. Paul focused almost all of the conversation on Jane's mom, sitting close to her on the couch and kind of flirting with her. When they all began eating, Mary noticed that Carla would only eat when Paul was eating. If Paul slowed down, Carla did too. And several times Paul told Carla to stop eating so fast. It was really odd. Then after dinner, Paul explained to Mary that they were very fond of her daughter, but Mary was not impressed by Paul's charms. She told him straight out that she was uncomfortable with the relationship and she didn't want Paul buying her daughter presents. So it was not long after that that Paul and Carla attended a school event in which Jane was competing. Of course, Jane's mom was there as well, and again, Paul continued to talk to her and tried to win her over. But she noticed that Paul and Carla rarely approached her together, and she felt like they were working both her and Jane. Several times, she felt sick as she watched Paul's hand on Jane's back or grazing her shoulder. And she thought, you know, this guy's creepy. No kidding. So that same day, Jane's instructor pulled her mother aside and told her that Jane had told her that Paul had been touching her breasts. So now her fears were confirmed. So a few days later, Mary drove to the Bernardo house. It seemed to take Paul forever to answer the door when she rang the bell. But finally he did. Paul reluctantly invited Mary into the home. And finally, after a few moments of uncomfortable small talk, Mary asked Paul why he was touching her daughter's breasts. Paul denied it. Jane's a friend of Carla's. I would have no reason to do that, Paul said. You're lying, said Mary. Then Paul's pleasant demeanor suddenly changed, and in a rage, he led Mary to the door, basically kicking her out. He told Mary that by the end of the day, Jane would know all about their conversation, and that she would also know that she had lost Carla as her best friend. And by the time Mary walked to her car and began driving away, Paul's screaming at her. Yeah, he went pretty nuts. He escalated pretty quickly. Absolutely. And despite the scene with Paul, Jane still insisted on continuing to visit the couple. So her mom compromised, telling Jane she could only visit on Thursday evenings when the Simpsons were on TV, and only if Mary dropped her off and picked her up. So Jane was allowed to continue seeing Paul and Carla on Thursdays. That is, until December 22nd, 1992 when Jane tearfully exited the Bernardo's dark house. The now 16-year-old walked around to the front of her mother's car and opened the back door. As she did, she handed her mother something that had been balled up tightly in her fist, and she said, Here, take this. I don't ever want to see it again. She was crying, and her mom saw that it was a gold necklace. It was a Christmas present from Paul Bernardo. So apparently Carla had pressured Jane to have sex with Paul that night, so she had left upset, wanting nothing more to do with the couple. But as you've probably figured out by now, the night she couldn't remember, things were done to her. I was sure of that. Yeah. So it turns out back when Jane and Carla had that first girls' night out, Carla had drugged Jane, and both Paul and Carla raped the girl. Carla had taken some of the drug Halcyon from the vet clinic and laced her drinks with it. So Halcyon is a strong benzodiazepine that was used to sedate animals for medical procedures. After Jane became unconscious from drinking the Halcyon and alcohol, Paul and Carla undressed her. Then Bernardo videotaped Carla raping the girl. Then Bernardo vaginally and anally raped the girl. The next morning, Jane had been sick and she'd vomited. She'd believed that this was from drinking alcohol for the first time, Remember, she'd written a letter of apology for vomiting in their house. So she'd had no idea that she'd been violated. On another visit in August, Jane had stopped breathing after she was drugged, while Bernardo was raping her. Carla had called 911, but had called them back one minute later when Jane was revived and told the dispatcher that everything was all right. So the first responders were called off, but it's just amazing to me that no one ever followed up on this incident. You think if you got a call like that, you'd at least go and check it out. But you they would. didn't. Then you call back and say, don't worry, it's okay? Yeah. No. That's not how it works. But it did. And from the beginning, Carla had lured Jane to her house 
and it was as a gift to Paul. So Jane was just a virgin for Paul to rape, and they had used her. The final incident with Jane had occurred almost exactly two years from the death of Carla's little sister, Tammy. So by 1990, Paul had been spending large amounts of time with the Homolka family, who really liked him. He was engaged to their oldest daughter, but he also flirted constantly with Tammy, who was just 15 years old. He hadn't told the family that he had lost his job as an accountant at this point. Instead, he was smuggling cigarettes across the U.S.-Canadian border, and he was becoming very obsessed with Tammy Homolka. He was peeping into her window and entering her room to masturbate while she slept. And Carla had actually helped him by breaking the blinds in Tammy's window so that he could stand outside and watch her. So it was in July when Bernardo took Tammy across the border to get beer for a party. And while there, Bernardo later told Carla they got drunk and he made out with her. Carla then laced spaghetti sauce with crushed Valium she had stolen from her employer, the Martindale Animal Clinic. And she served dinner to her sister, who soon lost consciousness. Then... Bernardo raped Tammy while Carla watched. And over that summer, Paul gave Tammy and her friends gifts. Food, sodas, just really tried to groom them. But the sodas had a film and white flecks on top. So he was drugging them. Yes, he was. Hey. If you've never Googled yourself, you might be shocked by how much personal information is out there for just anyone to find. I recently searched my email address and discovered my phone number and home address just a few clicks away. It's a scary invasion of privacy, and I had no idea how vulnerable I was to identity theft. Identity thieves can ruin your finances, and it can take months to get things back to normal. That's why I use Aura, today's sponsor. It's like a bodyguard for your personal information. They scour the internet, finding data brokers who sell your sensitive details, and then they automatically submit opt-out requests for you. Aura works 24-7 to keep your information safe. They also offer a VPN, antivirus, password management, and even identity theft insurance. With Aura, you get peace of mind knowing that you and your family are protected from the threats of the digital world. I value my privacy, and I value yours, too. Head on over to Aura.com TCB to start your two-week free trial. The link is also in the description below. Don't wait till it's too late. Take control of your personal information and protect yourself with Aura today. So it was six months before their 1991 wedding when Carla stole the anesthetic agent Halothane from the clinic. It was December 23, 1990, and Carla and Bernardo gave sleeping pills to the 15-year-old Tammy in rum and eggnog. They'd been celebrating the holiday with the Homolka family. Then after the parents went to bed, Carla and Paul invited Tammy to stay up with them and watch a movie in Carla's basement bedroom. After Tammy was unconscious, Carla and Bernardo undressed her, and Carla held a halothane-soaked cloth to her sister's face. So, Carla wanted to give Tammy's virginity to Paul Bernardo for Christmas, because according to Carla, he was disappointed by not having been Carla's first sex partner. So, with Tammy's parents sleeping upstairs, the couple filmed themselves as they raped Tammy in the basement, but Tammy began to vomit, and she stopped breathing. The couple tried to revive her and then they called 911. But they didn't call 911 until they took the time to hide evidence, dress Tammy, and moved her into her own basement bedroom. So, a few hours later, Tammy was pronounced dead at St. Catherine's General Hospital without ever having regained consciousness. Horrible. Despite Carla and Paul's behavior, vacuuming and washing laundry in the middle of the night, And despite the presence of a chemical burn on Tammy's face, the Niagara Regional Coroner and the Homolka family accepted their version of what had happened. So the official cause of Tammy Homolka's death was listed as accidental, that she had choked on her vomit after drinking alcohol. This is incredibly sad. There was no investigation, was there? Not really, no. Now, within days of Tammy's funeral, there was a change in the dynamics within the Homolka household. 
Dorothy and Carl noticed that Paul and Carla were never apart. Paul never let Carla out of his sight. Paul was moping around and talking about Tammy, as if the loss had hurt him the most. Yeah, there was a memorial service planned for Tammy at her high school, and the family planned to attend, all but Paul. As they made their way to the school, Dorothy suggested to Carla that Paul move back home. Since quitting his accounting job, Paul had been living with the Homolkas, and the plan had been that Paul would live with them until he and Carla were married in 1991, and he'd really had no intention of moving back home to Scarborough, and Carla wouldn't even consider this. So when she told Paul about the pressure coming from her parents for him to move, he became incredibly hostile. He complained that they no longer wanted him and no longer considered him part of the family. So it was all about Paul, for Paul and Carla. Yes, so... Never mind that these parents have lost their daughter in an incredibly horrible accident right before Christmas. And it wasn't an accident, of course. So do you think that the parents were starting to suspect Paul of something? Or were they Uh, just tired of having him in the house? I don't know. Um, Part of it could have been because his behavior, he was always crying and moping and talking about Tammy. You know, like this was his loss, not theirs. Right. So that had to be upsetting for them because they're trying to grieve and get over this. Also, he and Carla wouldn't postpone their wedding. So that made it tough to be planning a wedding within a few months after their baby daughters died. It would be very difficult. Very difficult. Finally, in late January, Paul told them he was moving out, but Carla decided to move out with him too. So they stayed at a local hotel for several days before answering an ad about a rental house in Port Dalhousie a suburb of St. Catharines near Lake Ontario. The monthly rent was $1,150. Paul gave the landlord post-dated checks. Throughout the two years that Paul and Carla lived in the home, the landlord never had a complaint about him. His rent was always paid on time, in fact, usually in advance and in cash. The perfect tenant. Right. But, you know, it had to be so difficult for Dorothy and Carl to celebrate their oldest daughter's wedding while mourning their youngest daughter. But Carla and Paul were just not sympathetic. They wanted the big wedding that they had planned, and they actually criticized her parents for wanting them to postpone it or just have a simple family wedding. Although Paul had acted like he was in mourning too, he and Carla videotaped themselves having sex and laughing with Carla wearing Tammy's clothing and pretending to be Tammy just a short time after Tammy's death. Carla was obsessed with keeping Paul happy and he was talking all of the time about how he no longer had Tammy available for him for his sexual pleasure. So see, that's what the loss was about for him. It really wasn't about a young girl losing her life at all. And he also blamed Carla for the death. So Carla had found a replacement when she started bringing Jane Doe home, and drugging and raping Jane had been a wedding gift for Paul, and remember, Carla had instigated that all on her own. But Carla and Paul were determined that the wedding they'd imagined and planned for would go ahead. They even suggested that Carl and Dorothy mortgage their house so they could pay for the wedding. There was talk about the appropriate way to recognize Tammy without destroying Paul and Carla's special day. Initially, Carla had wanted to leave an empty space for her as the bridesmaids made their way to the front of the church, or to leave an empty place setting at the head table. But others convinced her that that might be a little too morbid for a wedding day celebration. So it's left to Carl to remember their happy teen daughter, who was painfully absent on that big day. Yeah, it was really a big, expensive wedding, and Paul had expected the guests to give them very expensive gifts. He actually saw this wedding as a bit of a business opportunity and was expecting to make $50,000 from gifts. They were Hmm. married at the historic Niagara-on-the-Lake Church, and then were swept away afterwards on a white carriage led by white horses. Paul had controlled all of the wedding plans, insisting that Carla wear a $2,000 dress, and that Carla's vows included love, honor, and obey. So this is the early 90s, a $2,000 dress. That's a lot now, but back then it's incredible, really, Yeah. for, you know, working people. Well, you know, nothing's nothing but the best for Carla. And Paul. And Paul. Right. Well, actually, on the same day as Carla and Paul's wedding, the remains of a missing 14-year-old girl, Leslie Mahaffey, were discovered near the shore in Lake Gibson. 
So Leslie had been dismembered and her body parts were encased in cement in the water. Ew. Yeah, so Leslie Aaron Mahaffey was born on July 5th, 1976. She had a younger brother named Ryan. Her father was an oceanographer for the Canadian Federal Fisheries and Oceans Department, and sometimes he would be on assignments away from home for weeks at a time. Her mother worked as a teacher. But as she grew older, Leslie began to spend time away from the family home. Still, she always called home and kept in touch with her younger brother, Ryan. The siblings were very close. At the time of her abduction and subsequent murder in mid-June of 1991, just a few weeks before her 15th birthday, Leslie was a ninth grader. She went to M.M. M. Robinson High School in Burlington. So back on Monday, April 1st, 1991, shortly after she had been caught shoplifting at the Price Chopper in Burlington, Leslie left home and she took off with two girlfriends. Her parents signed a warrant of apprehension, which allowed police to take Leslie in and send her back home. They did find her on Saturday, April 13th, staying with an older teen in a room at the Crestwood Motel in Burlington. But three days later, she went missing again and was on the run with friends for six more days before police brought her home. The Mahaffeys told police that Leslie's problems came from peer pressure from friends that she had who were older and more streetwise. But while Leslie sought her independence by staying away from home, she did routinely call her family to tell them she was okay. So her parents never really considered Leslie a runaway because they always knew where she was. They kind of saw this as just a phase that she was going through in her teen years. But then Leslie's history of leaving home for a few days to be with friends meant that the police did not believe that she was abducted or harmed right away when she did actually disappear. So it was on the evening of June 14th when Leslie went to a funeral home to attend a wake for her friend Chris Evans, a boy who had died in a car accident earlier that same week. After the wake, a large group of teens met in the woods to drink and console one another. And as the evening wound down, a couple of friends walked Leslie home a little before 2 a.m., where they stayed with her while she found the side door locked, the side door to her house. So she told them the front door would definitely be unlocked, and she sent them home. But after they left her, she found out that the front door was locked as well. Her mother was trying to teach her a lesson about missing curfew. So now, though, Leslie's alone in the middle of the night. She walked to a payphone at a store called Max Milk, and she called a friend's house for permission to sleep over at her house. But her friend's mom said no, and that conversation ended just after 2.30 a.m. So Leslie said no problem, she'd go back home and wake up her mother to get inside the house. But then later that day, when Leslie didn't show up at the funerals of her friend Chris Evans and the other three teens who'd been killed in the car accident with him, her mother Debbie called the police. On June 18th, her mother, Debbie Mahaffey, filed paperwork to have her daughter found and arrested as a runaway. Early on the morning of June 15th, Paul Bernardo had taken a detour through Burlington, which is located halfway between Toronto and St. Catharines. Bernardo was looking to steal some license plates, and that's when he saw Leslie Mahaffey by herself. He would later say that he told her he was breaking into the house next door, and he offered her a cigarette, which he said was back in his car. Then when Leslie got close enough to the car, Bernardo wrapped his sweatshirt quickly around her head and forced her into the vehicle. He took her home to the house he shared with Carla. Now, Carla's version of this story is similar, but she would claim that once Paul got Leslie in the car, he pulled a knife on her to get her to comply. So once at the house with Leslie, Paul told Carla that he had a playmate for her. The couple then videotaped themselves torturing and sexually abusing Leslie, while Bob Marley and David Bowie music played in the background. At one point, Bernardo said, you're doing a good job, Leslie, a damn good job. Leslie cried out in pain, begging them to stop. He sodomized her while her hands were bound with twine. So these are some of the worst crimes ever. It's really hard to even talk about them. There's a definite gag factor in here. Absolutely. It's just horrible. Now, according to Paul Bernardo, the next day, Carla gave Leslie a lethal dose of Halcyon. But according to Carla, Bernardo strangled Leslie. They put Leslie's body in their basement. The next day, while Leslie's body was in the basement, Carla's family had dinner at Carla and Paul's house. 
At one point, Carla's mother was prevented from going into the basement to get something because Leslie's body was down there. So the basement was off limits. Don't go down there. So Paul and Carla decided that the best way to dispose of Leslie's body was to dismember her and encase each body part in cement. Bernardo bought a dozen bags of cement at a hardware store the next day. Andy kept the receipts, which would be used as evidence when he finally went on trial. Bernardo used his grandfather's circular saw to cut the girl's body. Then he and Carla made numerous trips to dump the cement blocks in Lake Gibson, which was about 18 kilometers south of their home in Port Dalhousie. At least one of the blocks weighed over 90 kilograms, or 200 pounds, and it ended up resting at the shore, where a father and son who were out fishing found it on June 29th, the Bernardo's wedding day. But identifying Leslie's body was difficult, and they ended up using her orthodontia to confirm her identity. She had braces. April of the following year, Carla and Paul went out to find another victim to sexually assault, torture, and murder. It was the afternoon of April 16, 1992, and the couple drove through St. Catharines, just out for a little drive, looking for young potential targets. It was after school on the day before Good Friday. 15-year-old Kristen French was a member of an ice skating team, which won several medals. And she was also a member of the girls' rowing team at Holy Cross Catholic Secondary School in St. Catharines. She was very popular in school and a great student. Students were still going home when Kristen started walking home, but the streets were almost empty. As they passed Holy Cross Secondary School, the Bernardo saw Kristen French walking briskly towards her nearby home couple pulled into the parking lot of nearby Grace Lutheran Church, and Carla got out of the car with a map in her hand, pretending that she needed directions. And as Kristen looked at the map, Paul Bernardo attacked her from behind, holding a knife and forcing her into the front seat of their car. From the back seat, Carla Homolka controlled the girl by pulling her down on her hair. So very involved. Carla's not an innocent bystander by any stretch of the imagination. I think she's be called an accomplice. Absolutely. So Kristen took the same way home every day, and it took her only about 15 minutes to get home, where she would first thing take care of her dogs. So soon after she should have arrived home, Kristen's parents became convinced that someone had taken her, so they called the police. Within 24 hours, Niagara Regional Police put together a team, and they searched the area along her route home. Investigators found several witnesses who had actually seen the abduction from different locations, so they had a pretty good picture of how the abduction had happened. Also, one of Kristen's shoes was recovered from the church parking lot. So over the three days of Easter weekend, Paul and Carla videotaped themselves as they tortured, raped, and sodomized poor Kristen French, forcing her to drink large amounts of alcohol and to behave submissively. At the Bernardo's trial, the Crown Prosecutor said that the Bernardo's always intended to kill Kristen because she was never blindfolded and she would have been able to identify both of them. While Paul was out buying pizza on April 18th, Kristen was at the house with Carla, and Paul was spotted while on this outing by a young woman who he had stalked the month before. Her report to police had been mishandled, as noted in a 1995 inquiry into the police investigation. So any chance that Kristen French had of being discovered alive at the Bernardo house was thwarted by that. If someone had just gone and searched that house, because they kept her alive for quite some time. They did. It was the next day when the couple murdered Kristen before they went to the Homolkas for Easter dinner. Kristen's nude body was found in a ditch on April 30, 1992, in Burlington, 45 minutes from St. Catharines. Kristen's body had been washed and her hair had been cut off, so it was originally thought that the hair was removed as a trophy, but then Carla would later say that she cut the girl's hair to impede the identification of her body. Investigators still weren't sure that Leslie and Kristen's cases were connected because Kristen's body had not been dismembered. But the Ontario government formed the Green Ribbon Task Force, and hotlines were set up, and forensic experts from the American FBI advised this task force. One witness to Kristen's abduction remembered seeing a struggle in a car that looked like a Camaro. 
Paul Bernardo's name came up again as a suspect from a tip received by the police, so they went to his house to interview him again. Paul was very polite when the police showed up at his door. He admitted to being a suspect in the Scarborough rape case because of his similar appearance to the composite sketch. Paul drove a Nissan, which looked nothing like a Camaro. Still, police contacted Toronto detectives to ask about their investigation into the Scarborough rapist. And that's how they learned that Bernardo's blood and saliva samples had not yet been tested. So he had not been cleared as a suspect, but at the same time, he wasn't being pursued as a suspect. Right. So we're sort of in limbo there. Well, they really didn't think he did it, which was stupid because it was just based on assumptions. Yeah, and, and you've got two different, not sightings, but suspicions of him. At least, yeah, two that we know of. He did look just like the sketch. If you look at the sketch, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. just looks like a picture of him. It's a good sketch. Absolutely. So on December 27th, 1992, Paul severely beat Carla with a flashlight. He hit her on her arms, legs, head, and face. Claiming that she'd been in a car accident, Carla returned to work on January 4th of 1993. But her co-workers called Carla's parents who assumed they were rescuing her the following day by physically removing her from the house. But Carla ran back in, frantically searching for something. Then her parents took her to St. Catherine's General Hospital, where her injuries were documented and she gave a statement to the police. Now she said she'd been a battered spouse and she filed charges against Paul Bernardo. He was arrested but then later released on his own recognizance. Carla moved in with one of her sister Lori's friends then, whose husband was a police officer. Then finally, in February of 1993, literally years after blood samples had been taken from Paul, the forensic lab in Toronto analyzed the blood, and these tests proved conclusively that Paul had raped the three women who had semen samples in their rape cases. If the blood had just been analyzed sooner, Paul Bernardo would have been in jail and Kristen and Leslie wouldn't have been raped and murdered. So it's kind of terrible to think about the missed opportunity there. Yeah, I guess nobody felt strongly enough about Bernardo being the culprit they didn't. To, to get those testing done sooner. Right, they really didn't. Detectives immediately put Bernardo under surveillance after that, though. And in the following days, more conclusive proof came back from the forensic team. In all, seven tests can be done to compare DNA fragment lengths. And in addition to the first tests, the second and third tests on Bernardo had come back positive, so there was enough evidence for an arrest. In the meantime, the sexual assault squad prepared surveillance on Bernardo to both collect further evidence and, of course, to ensure that he didn't attack any other victims. Yeah, on Wednesday, February 3rd, 1993, which was the first night of surveillance, A police team had watched Bernardo as he drove his Nissan to an Oakville shopping mall, arriving just after 9.30 in the evening. He circled the parking lot as the mall closed for the evening, slowing to look at groups of girls and young women as they entered and left the mall. On Monday, February 8, 1993, five days after Metro Toronto Police had started to tail Bernardo, investigators learned for the first time that Bernardo was a suspect in the Scarborough rapes piece of map found in the parking lot of Grace Lutheran Church the day of Kristen French's abduction had been from a map of Scarborough. Investigators learned that Metro Police had scheduled an interview with Bernardo's estranged wife, Carla Homolka, the next day. So when checking out Bernardo's name on the Green Ribbon Tip computers and in Niagara Regional Police files, investigators came up with tips and the subsequent May 12, 1992, visit to the Bernardo home at 57 Bayview Drive. So the detectives that went there said that nothing had looked out of place with Bernardo. He had a nice house, he had a wife, he had a dog, and he didn't have a Camaro. Further checks revealed that Carla had filed assault charges against her husband January 6, 1993, while she was in St. Catherine's General Hospital. So in order to learn more about Carla, police looked up the sudden death file on her little sister, Tammy Homolka. Interviews with investigators again raised the question of these red marks that were on Tammy's face at the time of her death. No one had ever known what they were. Paul had suggested to first responders that they could be carpet burns from him moving her, 
but that would mean that she was dragged face down on the carpet. And it didn't look like carpet burns either. We also know they couldn't have been burns from flame or heat because her hairs in the area had not been burned. So these were clearly chemical burns on Tammy's face. Chemical burns from the halothane that Carla had held to Tammy's face to make her unconscious so she could be raped and abused. When Carla first came into contact with the police after she was beaten by Paul, all the police knew was that she was a battered woman. But then Carla told the police that her husband was the murderer of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French. Then she told them that she had videotaped the assaults. Carla said that she wanted Paul to rot in jail because death was too good for him. So this is all kind of um, something to think about, in my opinion, because it seems like her family and friends forced her into getting help after she was beaten. And that's the only time she actually left Paul. Yeah. Although she knew all these horrible things he did, of course, because she did them too. She was a participant. So you have to wonder, or maybe think for sure, that when she goes to police and talks about, you know, how horrible he was, it's all just a way to protect herself and make herself just another victim. It's really hard to see it any other way. The detectives were really stunned to learn that Carla knew who had killed Leslie and Kristen. They had no leads and had made no arrests in that case, so at this point, they only saw Carla as a victim of domestic abuse. But then Carla told them that Paul had been out at night looking for potential victims, and she recounted the kidnapping of Leslie Mahaffey, telling them that it had happened just outside of her home. Carla said that she became aware of Leslie being in her house one night when Paul woke her up in bed and said, don't worry, honey, there's a girl in the basement, just go back to sleep. And Carla said that Paul wasn't satisfied with just raping the girl. He wanted to do it over and over again, and he wanted to videotape it. So she had been abducted for this purpose. Carla said that Leslie was terrified and knew she was going to die. But then Carla said she gave Leslie a teddy bear to comfort her. But she said Paul murdered and dismembered the girl, and he disposed of her in the lake. So Carla was trying to present herself as just another victim. She's trying to comfort this girl, but there's nothing she could do because she was afraid. But we do know that Paul left her alone with these girls, and she never helped them to escape. So over many days of interviews in 1993, Carla went on record with all of the details of Paul's crimes and the abuse that he had inflicted on her. She said that after the murder of Leslie, the violence against her at home increased, and he threatened her, and then he forced her to go with him to find more victims. So, she was with him when they saw Kristen. Carla asked Kristen for directions, and then Paul and Carla abducted her at knife point. Kristen was kept alive longer than Leslie, and she really endured horrible torture and abuse. Carla said that she felt empathy for Kristen, but she said she couldn't help her escape because she was afraid of what Paul would do to her or her family if she did anything. So that makes no sense to me. And if you go back and look at the death of Tammy, her parents were in the house. And then if you're still in any doubt, you have to think of Jane Doe, who Carla brought home on her own and actually drugged before Paul even got home. So you really could not have any more doubts about her involvement. Oh, well, when you know the whole story. Right. I mean, if it's just Carla telling you things, you're thinking, oh, this poor woman. Absolutely, and that's the problem. That's a big problem. So on February 17th, 1993, which was eight days after Carla told the police about the murders, Paul was arrested. His attorney, a Ken Murray, said he needed to see what evidence the police had against his client. Friends and family were interviewed, but they had not heard anything in the house when Kristen was held captive there. Well, not long after Paul's arrest, his link to the Scarborough rapes was confirmed through the media, and he was charged for the rapes. Carla told the police that Paul had told her he was the Scarborough rapist during their honeymoon. Remember, he had agreed to interviews and voluntarily gave blood and saliva samples, but the testing had actually taken over two years. Nine days after Carla told the police that Paul was the murderer of Kristen and Leslie, the media was wondering why he had not been charged with the murders and why his home had not been searched by the police yet. 
Paul was being held on the rapes, but he was denying being responsible for the murders. So basically at this point, it was just his word against Carla's. But Carla had told the police about videotapes of the two girls being held captive, raped, and beaten. So their focus now was to find these tapes. So the police began their search of the Bernardo house. Carla could not tell them the exact location of the tapes. The last time Carla said that she had seen the tapes was when they were hidden in the rafters in their garage. So the search went on for 10 full weeks. It was a very in-depth search. They ripped up concrete. They went through the drainage system. They went through all the carpet, but they found no physical evidence and didn't find any of the tapes. So they started to believe that Paul Bernardo had destroyed the tapes. They really had nothing now but Carla to tie Bernardo to these crimes. So we're back to the he said, she said. Yes. So the police had to explore how much of what Carla did was due to Paul's coercion. Otherwise, her testimony would probably be ineffective at trial. Carla was very vulnerable to cross-examination. So the police sent Carla to a psychiatric institution to be assessed. One psych report said that she had no agency and was incapable of making autonomous decisions. Reports all indicated that she was a battered wife suffering from learned helplessness. They believed that Carla was broken down and had no control over her life while she was in the relationship with Bernardo. Yeah, police decided that they had enough evidence of Carla being a battered wife to make her their star witness. But Bernardo's attorney, Ken Murray, asked for access to the Bernardo house after the police search warrant had expired. Murray wanted to access the house to get whatever information he could. Murray and his law clerk, Kim Doyle, were given permission to go into the house, and Kim went through garbage bags full of papers in the house. Murray came in with a piece of paper that had instructions on it from Paul Bernardo, and this Kim Doyle watched him as he did this. She saw Murray read the note, and then he got onto the bathroom counter and started taking out a light fixture. She saw him reach in until his arm was all the way in, and he started pulling out videotapes. Kim saw six tapes, and she was shocked. But then she was asked to view the tapes, and then she saw Carla's participation in these horrible crimes. Carla had participated in sexual activities with both Kristen French and Leslie Mahaffey, and there was no sign on the tapes of coercion or threats from Paul against Carla. I've had a question about these tapes for quite some time. The authorities had, what, 10 weeks of ten searching? 10 weeks, yep. And they, they literally destroyed the house. They did. They tore it apart. And they couldn't find these tapes. Nope. It's kind of unbelievable. It kind of is, but when you think about where they were, they were pretty deep in there. I guess they would have had to knock down the wall to get to them, well, not they, knowing. they knocked down plenty of walls. They did. I'm not making excuses. But I'm just saying they did not find them. Yeah. And that's part of the problem of why Carla was not held to account as she should have been, in my opinion. Well, if they obviously, if they had the tapes, it would have been a different outcome. Yeah, I think so. It would have had to be. But watching these tapes was actually very traumatic for the legal assistant. Now, 30 years later, she says it still triggers her. The tape showed Carla's participation not only in the sexual assault of Kristen and Leslie, but in the death of her little sister Tammy. That was on tape as well. Carla had given her sister as a Christmas gift to Paul because he had wanted to take Tammy's virginity. Can you get much worse than that? Oh, maybe, but it'd be tough. It would be very tough. This is her little sister. It's revolting. So it turns out Bernardo had given his attorney, Ken Murray, directions on where to find the videotapes that the police had failed to find. Only Murray had the tapes, which were critical evidence. In every encounter with Tammy, Kristen, and Leslie, Carla became an active participant, and in some cases, she actually orchestrated what happened to the girls. So this totally undercuts the idea that Carla was a victim. There was really no hint of her being passive or even reluctant in any of these recordings. But the police don't know about the tapes, and they're counting on Carla as their witness to get a conviction against Paul. Murray did not divulge the tapes. No, Ken Murray has the tapes with this explosive information to impeach Carla's credibility, and after seeing Carla as a willing participant, Murray could create a defense strategy to pin the crimes on her 
and prove her to be a liar. But in his inexperience, Murray decided to conceal the tapes until the time of the trial. Now, we, and I'm sure most of our listeners, know that that's illegal. There's no law that allows lawyers to conceal any physical evidence. So how this Murray did not know that is amazing to me. I don't know how that's possible. Although I know people can be incompetent in their field. We've seen plenty of doctors who were horrible. I'm sure there are plenty of horrible lawyers. Yeah, well, it's better than saying I intentionally withheld the tapes. Yeah. Well, so you think maybe he did know? I think so. That it was illegal? Yeah. Well, maybe, but his assistant knew about them. It wasn't a total secret. Yeah, well, his assistant will defer to Murray. And if he knew it was illegal, then he knows it's going to come out at trial that he withheld them and he'll be in trouble then. So I can't imagine how he would think he would get away with that unless he thought he was allowed to do it. Yeah, I just don't see how he could not know that. I know, I agree. But it kind of seems like he didn't. So meanwhile, police were taking their time trying to build up the credibility of Carla as a witness. She wanted to know if they'd found the tapes. Of course she did. They hadn't, so they had no choice but to believe her version of events. But they wanted her to give more details of what was on these tapes. So to stay ahead of the narrative and give her version of the story before the police might see her tapes, Carla said that she was forced to participate and forced to perform sexual acts on the girls. She said that she tried to befriend Kristen French, like they'd do their makeup together and spend time together, like it was a slumber party with the two of them whenever Paul wasn't there. So that, to me, was very unbelievable. But Carla realized that what was done to Tammy was on these tapes as well, so she did tell the police about Paul's culpability in Tammy's death. It had been determined to be just a tragic accident, but it wasn't. And Carla explained that Paul was so persistent about wanting to have sex with her little sister that she finally gave in. She said she decided she would let it happen once and then he wouldn't bother her about it again. So what do you think about that? Bullshit? Yeah. Yeah. Ridiculous. I can't even believe the police believed her. But I guess not seeing the tapes, you know, it's hard to say. Well, you get back to what's believable without the tapes. Right. So, Carla said that Paul forced her to provide the halothane from the veterinary clinic in huge doses and drug her sister into unconsciousness. But Carla claimed to the police that she held a cloth with the halothane several inches from Tammy's face. But we know that's not true. In order for Tammy to have those facial burns, she had to have actually applied that cloth to her sister's face. Right. And as a veterinary office assistant, Carla had to know that this was a potentially deadly chemical. So for her to apply it to Tammy's face was very close to just murdering her sister outright. Carla said that Paul had both vaginal and anal sex with Tammy. But what she didn't say, and what was on the tapes, was that Carla performed cunnilingus on Tammy while she was unconscious, while the parents were sleeping upstairs. Carla did nothing to protect her sister or stop the drugging or the rapes or any of it. But talking with police, Carla became more comfortable over time, and she started to think, well, maybe the tapes will never be found. So her innocent persona began to slip a bit. She admitted that she had actually demanded that Kristen French be murdered so they could enjoy Easter dinner at her family's house. So she's starting now to sound like a complete sociopath. So Carla said that Paul said to her, why don't we just not go to Easter dinner? And she said to him, Well, how will it look if we don't go anywhere while this girl is missing? We'll have no alibi. So Paul had agreed and murdered Kristen. Carla said Paul wanted to keep Kristen longer, but she didn't want her to be there anymore. So this is just a shocking admission. (laughs) But at this point, the police needed her so desperately in order to convict Paul that they're letting a lot of things go, which they really shouldn't have. No, the police thought that the important thing was to get Bernardo off the street even if they had to make a deal with Carla. Well, and that's a debate. You could debate that either way. You sure could. But anyway, there was a video of Carla doing a walkthrough of the house with the police. It's chilling. Carla deliberately dressed up in an outfit appropriate for a schoolgirl. And she asks if any of the furniture had been damaged by the search. She looks so detached and emotionless. She, she also does. asks if she can take a book from the house. She couldn't even act empathetic in a believable fashion. No, she was walking around that house like she was looking at an apartment to rent or something. 
very casual, very detached. Definitely something wrong with her. But meanwhile, Ken Murray's still holding on to the tapes without the prosecution being aware of it. And the police made a plea agreement with Carla. This would later be called a deal with the devil. And the deal was if Carla agreed to plead guilty to two counts of manslaughter for Leslie and Kristen, she would get a lenient sentence for her involvement. And then she would be the witness for Bernardo's prosecution. So the deal was five years each for the deaths of Kristen and Leslie, plus two additional years for the death of her sister Tammy. Twelve years total. And this means the price of Tammy's life was two years. And then Carla would be eligible for parole in just four years. Definitely a deal with the devil. Sweetheart deal for Carla, though, huh? She really made out well, yes. Then a last-minute deal was made for a publication ban around Carla's plea deal and her involvement in the case. The only thing that could be reported by the media was her sentence, but not the reason behind it. Government was obviously worried that the plea deal facts would cause a public outcry about giving a murderer such a light sentence. Well, you <laughs> and know, they I'd were say, right. Yeah, rightly so. They knew that what they were doing did not look good. And then Ken Murray began to speak out about Carla to the media. People really didn't know what her story was, and Murray said that the prosecution was protecting her. Paul Bernardo was charged with two counts of first-degree murder, two counts of unlawful confinement, two counts of kidnapping, two counts of aggravated sexual assault, and then one count of causing indignity to a human body. Then Bernardo's attorney, Ken Murray, applied to be taken off the case. So apparently, Murray had consulted with legal authorities and he was told that the tapes needed to be handed over to another attorney because he had held on to the tapes for 15 months. Murray had held back the tapes in order to use them to impeach Carla's credibility when Paul Bernardo's trial came around. And if he'd handed them over to police back when he'd gotten them, Carla likely wouldn't have had such a good plea deal. Maybe no plea deal at all. Probably not. So Murray did give the tapes to Bernardo's new attorney, John Rosen, who was a very experienced defense attorney. When he saw the tapes, he saw Leslie and Kristen being held captive and sexually assaulted. He was an experienced criminal attorney, but he still said that the tapes made him cry. So they were devastating. And he did give the tapes to the police as he was required to do. So the police and prosecutors were seeing the tapes at the same time. And I can't imagine how they felt about their star witness now, right? Oh, they must have felt horrible. Horrible. They've gone from looking at her as an abused wife who was finally trying to make things right. And now they see that she's totally the opposite. Right. She's another predator. Well, she'd blatantly lied to the police, and she'd held back her role in Tammy's death altogether, as well as her assaults on Kristen and Leslie. But I think the most damaging thing for her as a witness was likely the whole segment that Carla had not told the police about, where she and Paul sexually assaulted the girl who we call Jane Doe, because Carla didn't even mention that victim. Well, no, because that's not going to put her in a good light. No, the whole assault of Jane Doe was Carla's doing. She brought her friend, a younger girl named Jane, to the house and tranquilized her before Paul even got home. And then, I mean, Jane could have died. They called 911 when she stopped breathing. It's just um, a miracle that she didn't die. So this was very disturbing, and Carla had coldly victimized Jane Doe as a gift to Paul, just like she had with her sister. And now that the police knew this, they had to decide if they would cancel the plea deal. But if they charged her, they would damage their own witness, so they've kind of got themselves in a predicament here. Major predicament. Yeah. The tapes didn't show the murders of Leslie Mahaffey or Kristen French, so the prosecution was still heavily relying on Carla's testimony to get murder convictions against Paul. They had no physical or visual evidence that he was the killer. Without Carla, they could only convict Bernardo of the sexual assaults. So... They chose to swallow hard and continue with Carla as their star witness. Yeah, the only way to rehabilitate Carla as a witness was to ensure that she could be viewed as a victim. So what the prosecution did is they got a psychiatrist from California to come over and come forward and say that Carla suffered from trauma that caused her to have memory loss. 
So now they had an explanation for why Carla never told them about the sexual assault of Jane Doe. They claimed that she hadn't remembered it, so she hadn't really lied to the police. (laughs) A fine point. So Dr. Hatcher, the psychiatrist from California, was an expert in battered women's syndrome, and part of his opinion would be trauma and dissociated amnesia. But other psychiatrists have disagreed with this, because Carla remembered many details of the other sexual assaults, but claimed not to remember the assault of Jane Doe. And again, she was the one who brought Jane Doe home and drugged her without Paul even prompting her. On May 18th, 1995, Paul Bernardo's trial began. This was a big deal in Canada, kind of like the O.J. Simpson trial here in the United States. Yeah, it was really explosive. There were so many people outside the courtroom. And at that point, they didn't know about how Carla had participated or any of that yet. Right. Because remember, there was a media ban, so none of that was released to the public. Not a bit. So his trial for manslaughter for Tammy Homolka and the Scarborough rapes would be held at a later different trial. But because the videotapes existed, there was no way for Bernardo's attorney to defend the abductions, the unlawful confinement, or the sexual assaults. They concentrated on who was responsible for the deaths. And the only alternative suspect, of course, was Carla Homolka. They already knew that she was a killer from her giving halothane to her sister. Paul thought he could get away with things, but they think that Carla was the more practical one who knew that things had to be cleaned up to hide their crimes. So the defense's theory was that Carla was in charge of these decisions and that she was the one who decided that the victims couldn't be allowed to live after their abductions. And there was some evidence of that in her, what she said to police. Yeah, there was. And then there, was, there were many people that believed that Carla should have been on trial for first-degree murder, along with Paul Bernardo. Yeah, most people. When the trial started, only professionals involved in the case had actually seen the videos. So this was the first time that video evidence was available for such serious crimes. But the tapes would be played for the jury in the trial, and victims' families would be seeing them as well. Yeah, or at least hearing them. Sure hope they got warned beforehand. I'm sure they did, but it's still, it's traumatic. Even for people who didn't know the girls, they had long-term psychological issues. Yeah, I don't, I don't think any amount of knowledge beforehand would prepare you for what they looked like. No, I would never want to watch them or listen to them. An attorney for one of the families didn't want the public to be able to see the videos, understandably, or even hear descriptions of what was on the tapes. For the families of Kristen and Leslie, these tapes would be extremely painful and traumatic to watch. People who didn't know the victims at all had already been really traumatized by this footage. So there's a very valid idea that if a tape of a sexual assault is played, that's re-victimizing the victim, which I can see. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But the jury needed to hear and see what was done to the girls in order for justice to really be done. The media wanted the tapes to be released for public consumption, which I think is insane. So the judge decided that the tapes would be played in the courtroom and the jury would have to see them, but the public in the courtroom would not see them. They would, however, hear the audio whenever a victim was on screen. So the jurors were aware that the videos existed, but of course they could never have imagined how horrible they were. Like you said, no matter how much warning... I don't think you can be warned about that to actually understand how horrible that would be. No, me either. So the screen was turned toward the jury in the courtroom to keep the rest of the courtroom from seeing them. But hearing the voices may have been just as bad, or even worse maybe, than seeing the video. Just listening to the horrible voices and crying, your imagination would have to run wild. Yeah, it would. It might be worse than seeing it. I don't know. Leslie Mahaffey's mother, though, was determined to be there and hear the tapes. So she sat and listened, and it was devastating, not only for her, but anyone around her. There were wails of pain, and you could hear the girls begging for them to stop what they were doing to them. Debbie Mahaffey actually had to be physically supported in order to leave the courtroom, and the TV news would describe her face as contorted in pain. Her knees actually buckled as she tried to get out of the courtroom. I don't know why she was determined to hear it, but she'll never forget it. It's horrible. I really wish that someone had stopped her from listening. You know, jurors have described watching these videos as a hideous experience 
because not only are you watching these young girls being raped and tortured, but there's nothing you can do to save them. So it kind of reminds me of when um, we watch that See No Evil show or any kind of crime show where they have tapes. Not tapes like these, of course, but you might see the tape of a girl leaving Target and you might see someone following her that's going to end up murdering her. And you just want to stop it, right? You just, oh my God, but you can't. So just imagine if that's your daughter and these horrible things are being done. It's really unimaginable. So it wasn't until the trial that the public knew about the extent of Carla's involvement. Now everyone knew that she was Paul Bernardo's partner, not his victim. She knew right from wrong, and she had many opportunities to get away and to save the victims. But of course, she never did. Carla's mother, Dorothy Homolka, did take the stand. She did not agree that there was any evidence that her daughter was being abused or victimized by Paul. She did think that Carla had seemed happy and very in love with Paul, though. And it's interesting that Carla did have her own bank account, and she even would go off on trips with her girlfriends. So that doesn't sound like someone who's in a controlling, abusive relationship. Paul probably did beat her. We're not sure, but she did have injuries. But he certainly wasn't controlling her life. No, he wasn't. Now, one of the most damaging videos for Carla was what is called the fireside chat tape. In 1991, Carla and Paul made a video where Carla pretends to be Tammy. This is just weeks after they killed Tammy. It's disgusting. Carla is dressed up in Tammy's clothing, has her hair like Tammy wore hers. She's acting like she's Tammy in order to satisfy Paul. Paul has sex with her, and Carla talks in Tammy's voice, moaning and saying, You were so wonderful. You took the virginity of those girls. I was so proud of you. So that tape gets played. Everybody knows the true picture of Carla. Yeah, she's evil. Really evil. These are just shit people. So Paul did take the stand in his defense, and he tried to come across as very normal and put together. But of course, he was hated. The defense was focused on the homicide, so his attorney asked him if he had killed Leslie Mahaffey. And he said no. He said Carla killed her. When asked if he killed Kristen French, he said no. And again, he said Carla did it. He said he didn't want to kill either girl. He said that Leslie had been blindfolded and Kristen had no idea where she was being held. But Carla said they couldn't let them go and she killed them. Well, there's nothing else really that he can say. No. And I would think with felony murder, they're both just as guilty no matter who actually did the murder. Well, they would be. I would uh, think so. She cut that sweetheart deal. Yes, I know. It's just really disturbing. But remember, she had told the police that she wanted to go to Easter dinner. Yeah. So she just kind of killed the girl so she could get it out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Tie up the loose ends. Let's go. Really just, uh, you know what? It's just really sick that these two people met because they're a terrible combination. They're a lethal couple. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. So Paul's story was that he was a serial rapist and a sexual sadist, but he was not a murderer. Paul said that after he came back to the house with food and rented videos, Kristen was dead. Carla told him that Kristen had wanted the restraint around her neck loosened, and when Carla did that, Kristen tried to escape. By doing that, she strangled herself with the electrical cord. He said that Carla told him that she had to hit Kristen on the head with a mallet several times to subdue her as this was happening. Wow. Yeah, I know. So when Carla took the stand, she wore this soft beige clothing She was just trying to appear to look innocent and young. So when the defense attorney approached her, he showed her a photo of Tammy and asked her who that was. So she looked uncomfortable and she said, this was my sister Tammy. Then he showed her a photo of Tammy in her coffin. And he said, and this is what you and him over there did, pointing at Paul. Then he pulled out a photo of Leslie and had her identify her. Then he showed her a photo of Leslie's body parts in cement and said, and this is what you and him did to her. Then he took out a photo of Kristen French and she identified Kristen. Then he said, this is the girl you abducted and you killed her too, didn't you? So he got Carla pretty uncomfortable. I can imagine. And she said no. But after that, her um, demeanor would change a little. She had a hard time not being angry. Rosen's cross-examination of Carla went on for the better part of the next two weeks. He tore apart her story of being a battered wife. Carla seemed caught off guard. 
and she eventually became hostile and dismissive on the stand. So she ended up coming across as a strong person, and the stronger she appeared, the less like a victim she appeared to be. And the jury obviously hated her. Very shocking that a woman could do such horrible things to young girls. Yeah, I mean, of course it's horrible for anyone to do something like that to anyone, especially young girls, young people. But the fact that a woman would do it seems like just more of a betrayal. And then if you think about Tammy, if your own big sister... Mm, that's your sister. Yeah, it's just an amazing betrayal. So the jury began their deliberations on August 31st. They clearly hated both Bernardo and Homolka, but of course they only had Bernardo on trial. The next day they had their verdict. Bernardo was found guilty on all nine counts, including first-degree murder. Outside of the courthouse, Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French's fathers gave statements. Mr. Mahaffey said that the trial is over, but Leslie still would not be coming home. Mr. French said that no one could hurt Christy anymore and that they love her. So there were a lot of tears, especially from those poor girls' mothers. Then there was another hearing on the Scarborough rapes and the death of Tammy Homolka after Bernardo was convicted at the first trial. And he was determined to be a dangerous offender and would likely never get out of prison. But his accomplice, Carla, was eligible for release in just a few years. Obviously, people were upset that Carla was not held accountable, but the prosecutor believed it was the only thing that could have been done when they didn't have the tapes. The public felt that justice wasn't served and Carla was getting away with murder. So they say there was nothing else they could have done while they uh, didn't have the tapes. But then when the tapes came out, I would think that lying to the police would clearly be a violation of the plea deal, and that could be canceled. Yeah. And I guess that's where I don't understand. It's where it loses me. Well, me too. Yeah. And a lot of the public as well. There were other victims on the tapes, of course, including Jane Doe, and charges were never laid against Carla for what was done to that 15-year-old girl. Carla said that she had forgotten about it, but we know that isn't true. Carla had lied to the police and the prosecutor, clearly a violation, and that means that the 12-year sentence could have been overturned and she could have been sentenced for all of her crimes, but for whatever reason, that did not happen. An announcement was made that a judge would look at the plea deal and see if mistakes had been made. That was done. The judge came back and said that it would not be in the public interest to prosecute Homolka. He said that they couldn't take back a deal that they had made or they would lose all future credibility with anyone we need to be a cooperating witness. Yeah, but that's not really true. No, it's not. Because you can be a cooperating witness and if you don't lie to the police, you get the deal. But she lied. She lied. And this didn't satisfy the public either. In this judge's report, he said that Jane Doe had been ambivalent about whether charges should be brought against Carla Homolka. But this is directly contradicted in an article that was published in the Toronto Sun in May of 2005. It says that Jane Doe never agreed with prosecutors to waive the charges against Homolka. Jane Doe said that she was never consulted at all and had no input. Jane Doe said she thinks it's disgusting that Carla was able to get a psychology degree from Queen's University while in prison and has a better education than she has and that she had to pay for it as a taxpayer. Just outrageous. Sure is. Yep. So Carla's parole review stated, Carla Homolka is a person highly artificial, articulate, manipulative, who is egocentric, if not narcissistic, and whose behavior cannot be explained solely on the basis of intimidation or abuse by Paul Bernardo. Despite her ability to present herself well, there is a moral vacuity, an absence of empathy for her victims, which suggests tendencies towards psychosis. Yeah, but after serving her full 12 years in prison, Carla was released on July 4, 2005. She had served her time, and she wasn't even registered as a sex offender because she was never charged with any of her sex crimes. So she may be the only convicted serial killer who's free to live her life just like any other citizen. She's never publicly apologized 
or voiced any regret for her crimes. So Carla settled down in Quebec. She was fluent in French, and her case was less well-known in the French-speaking community. She married the brother of her defense lawyer and had three children. Then she changed her name to Leanne Bordelais. She sometimes volunteered for school activities, and she did chaperone children on a school outing. And then when the parents found out who she really was, they were very upset. So it seems like wherever she goes, once the community finds out, she is rejected. So she does move around, and fortunately, it's not that easy for her. So what about her three children? They're going to be reading about her crimes and what she really did, as compared to what she likely says to whitewash what she did. So it's really difficult to understand what that will be like for them, to think that their mother did these things. Well, I'm sure they've gotten bits and pieces of it. Yes, but I'm sure it's been whitewashed, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I hope they're able to get therapy, because that's not going to be easy. And who knows what she's like as a mother, my God. You know, who knows what she does? She's a scary person. So like I kind of referred to earlier, there are many people who worked on the Bernardo Hamalka case who suffered from PTSD and depression after seeing those videotapes. Of course, it's much worse for the victim's families, and the families fought for years to get the tapes destroyed. Finally, all known copies of the tapes were incinerated in an undisclosed location, and the house where the girls were held captive, raped, and murdered was demolished. It's been argued by some that since Carla Homoka showed a willingness to help the police, that meant she was sorry for her actions and wanted to help reverse the wrongs that had been done. Now, although she did help to convict Paul Bernardo for the rapes and murders of both Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French, it's more likely she used her knowledge for her own benefit, leaving out any information that would lead to a harsher punishment for her. She was in control of the information that she gave to investigators. Absolutely she was. Other than Paul Bernardo, Carla was the only person involved in the crimes, and of course she knew the whole truth. She wouldn't have wanted to get herself into more trouble, so she withheld information and conveniently could not remember and did not mention at all Jane Doe. In March 2005, in a McLean's Magazine article titled Carla Homolka, Girl Next Door, the author examined rumors and worst-case scenarios following the release of Carla. The article also had large color photos of Carla in prison, which were sold to McLean's by a former inmate, at Joylet Institute. The images include Carla on a swing, sunbathing, wearing some Calvin Klein clothes, and wearing a cocktail dress. The images alone made the public question the fairness of Carla's sentencing, because it looks more like she was away at college than in prison for manslaughter. The former inmate that sold the pictures described the institution as an adult daycare center that pampered its inmates. So not only did she have a short sentence, seems like she had a pretty relaxed sentence, and was able to get a college degree, which many hardworking people can't afford to do. Yeah, looks like she came out pretty well. It does. As so many sexual sadists are, Paul Bernardo's a psychopath. During his time in court, he appeared puzzled whenever the Crown Attorney confronted him with the immorality of forced sex. He described cutting up Leslie Mahaffey's body in a clinical sense and devoid of any emotion. So Bernardo's an easy one to figure out, but the troubling questions left are about Carla. What if Carla, not Paul, killed the girls? Now the jury, weighing all the evidence, chose to believe that Bernardo had committed the murders. Well, but they had no way of convicting her of them. No, they didn't. No. She had already gotten the plea deal. Exactly. The jury chose to reject Paul's explanation that the two schoolgirls met their deaths during their brief times when he left them alone with Carla. But the public will never know what really happened in that Cape Cod home in Port Dalhousie. Well, Carla's harshest critics are women. She receives severe judgment because she herself is a woman who contributed to the deaths of three young girls and the assaults and rapes of others. Because many believe that Carla hid behind the excuse of being a battered woman, she may have outsmarted everyone to get away with murder. If Carla's story is taken at face value, she's someone to be pitied. If not for the tapes, she would likely have been seen as just a victim. No one would have thought that an attractive young couple would have been involved in so many sinister things. 
They really did destroy the stereotype of evil that many lay people and even experts have lived by. In the end, authorities decided that they had no option but to make a deal with Carla, but since she did lie, her plea deal might have been thrown out, so why wasn't it? So you have to wonder, was there something about her being a woman that helped her to get a much lower sentence? In reviewing the police investigation and how the prosecution handled the legal proceedings, more than just her gender led to Carla being sentenced so differently. But common sense tells us that a man in her position would never get away with what she did. Never. No, you're right about that. Now, looking at the psychological assessments of Carla and excerpts from her trial, there seems to be a definite gender bias. And this bias began when she was admitted to a psychiatric institution and labeled a victim. That comes with an assumption that she is not smart enough to recognize what was happening in a relationship with Paul, and she was not capable of evaluating the situation and making decisions to free herself from him. Now, it's very unlikely that a man in her situation would ever be labeled a victim. No, and the facts don't support Carla as a victim who stayed in the background and was forced to commit her crimes. But the battered woman defense can cover a wide variety of contradicting behaviors. And it benefited the prosecution to have her as a battered woman in order to make her a sympathetic and credible witness. But, you know, once on the stand, her true character really came out. But it was too late because she already had her plea deal. Carla was labeled as a battered wife and a victim throughout her plea deal negotiations. Evidence of this was considered by the court regardless of the other evidence against her. So I think it was a combination of her being a woman labeled as a victim and the prosecution's need to make sure justice was done to Paul Bernardo that got her that plea deal and that light sentence. Bernardo has been in prison since his arrest on February 17, 1993. He appeared before the board for his parole hearing 25 years later in October of 2018 and parole was denied. The panel presiding at that hearing concluded, among other things, that he showed minimal insight into his crimes and he remained a threat to public safety. He's up for parole again this year. In 2018, he was transferred from a maximum security facility to a medium security facility. Yeah, I was kind of surprised by that. Um, Apparently, it still has a huge amount of security, but I don't know why he went down to a medium security facility. I don't think someone like him will ever change. If he was out, he would offend again immediately, I bet. I think he would. Yeah. Maybe not immediately, but he would be a repeat offender. He would still be doing it if he hadn't been caught, for sure. So this is a super disturbing case, but on the bright side, it's very rare for a couple to be murderers like this. So it's not something we'll see much of, thank goodness. Yeah, well, I hope we don't do too many more like this. (laughs) <laughs> but it is fascinating, the whole trial and the tapes and the plea deal. Well, yeah, the psychological part Yeah, once you get past the horrid crimes, yeah. there is some fascinating stuff to discuss, for sure. Okay, talking about fascinating stuff, we're going to do some feedback with some fascinating voicemails and emails. But before we get to that, I just want to say if you're a TCB Premium subscriber with automatic payments made with PayPal, We need you to go to our website, tiegrabber.com, and update your payment information, and that way you can avoid missing out on your ad-free and bonus shows. You can still use PayPal, or you can switch to a credit card, and I apologize for this, but in the long run, the updates have made this worth the hassle. There's a post with instructions on the website, and I even put a link in our show notes to help you out with this. And if you aren't a member... You really need to catch up with what's hip and going on in society nowadays and join. We have bonus shows and ad-free versions of our regular episodes and some really interesting cases in our archives and coming up. So you can subscribe at tigrabber.com or by going to our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash tigrabber. It's time for listener feedback. So what have we got for feedback? So we've got a couple voicemails and a couple emails. And there's a lot going on in all these. 
We have another case suggestion from Nate, our biggest fan, and that's a voicemail. Hi, Dick and Jill. This is Nate again. Um, I have a uh, interesting case for you guys. There were two cases of neonaticide at Muskegon University in Ohio. Uh, one of them, Jennifer Bryant, she ended up serving less than a year in prison, but the other, uh, Emily Weaver, ended up getting life without parole for the cases. Now, neonaticide is kind of a rare crime. I think there's only 300 cases in the United States a year, maybe. But it's interesting that both of those happened at the same college, a little over like 10 years apart. And the sentences were vastly different. And, you know, I was wondering if you guys could explain, you know, what neonaticide is. And, you know, how frequent it is. I realize it's the murder of a baby and that might not be everyone's cup of tea. But I think it's interesting because neither of those cases have ever received any podcast coverage. So I think that, you know, both of those at one university, it's kind of interesting to explore mentally how neonaticide happens, you know, that postpartum psychosis, what it is, etc., but yeah, I mean, I just think you guys would enjoy it, or maybe not enjoy it is the best word, but that it would be interesting to explore because it's a case that, you know, no one really covers. But um, yeah, that's about it. But I just found it interesting that two cases in Ohio had at the same university. So look up Emily, E-M-I-L-E, Weaver, and then Jennifer Bryant, and then Muskegon, it's like M-U-S-K, I don't know how to spell it, University. But if you look up those cases, you'll find out information. I can also email it to you. But anyway, you guys, uh, both of you, I hope you're doing well. And uh, cheers. Thank you, Nate. So I really can't say that I know anything about this. So I'm going to leave this one to you, Dickie. Well, it is interesting. Both these women had pregnancies that they tried to hide. And they delivered the babies and basically disposed of them. And there's a vast difference in sentencing the First case was in the early 2000s. That was Jennifer Bryan. She was sentenced to three years in prison. And as Nate said, served like a year or so. And then in 2015, so 11, 12 years later, Emily Weaver delivered a baby and disposed of it in a way similar to the Bryan baby. This child, I guess adult, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. So he got kind of a slap on the wrist, three-year sentence. It turned out to be a one-year. And... Another one who's in prison without parole. Big oh. difference. Yeah, right. So, excuse my ignorance, but neonaticide, how is that different from... Infanticide? Yes, yes, exactly. Well, what's a neonate? First 30 days of life, 28 days? Yeah, so. that's vaguely ringing a bell. So there's, I mean, it's probably just semantics. But the other thing Nate had mentioned may be some problem of postpartum depression or psychosis. But these babies were killed very shortly after birth, so... You, you're not going to have postpartum depression or psychosis at that point. That's going to show up later. That's true. And I know we don't get political, but you have to wonder if with these new abortion laws coming out, if we might have more of these happening from, you know, girls that are desperate, that have been raped or involved in some kind of incestual crime, and they don't know what to do. It's an interesting point. Yeah, it's really scary. But I think that that is, that could be connected in some cases. So that makes it scary. Okay, so we have another case suggestion from Carolyn. Actually, Carolyn's got five cases. Wow, and she does it all in a minute and a half? Yep. Way to go, Carolyn. She's not a fast talker, (laughs) but she's straight to the point. All right, let's hear it. Hi, Jill and Dick. This is Caroline phoning from Melbourne, Australia. I'm just sending you a voicemail to say thank you so much for all the hard work and care that you put into creating this podcast. I just discovered it and I'm going through the back files now. I love your delivery. I can see that you put a lot of care and respect um, and research into each case that you deliver. And I do also love the beer reviews because it kind of lightens the mood a bit. And they do sound delicious, but uh, I'm not sure I'll get access to too many unless I'm in the States. I also have a few case suggestions for you that might be of interest. There's a few historical ones I thought you might be interested in. I know you have a lot of Australian listeners, but the Claremont killings in uh, WA and Ivan Malat, who is the backpacker killer, and he mainly operated in New South Wales. And the last one is Peter Falconio, who was murdered in Northern Territory or WA. 
that made national news, uh, international news, uh, because he was a, a UK resident. A couple of recent cases in the state of Victoria, in my state where I live, Erin Patterson from a place called Wonthaggy. Now, she's just been charged with three counts of murder because allegedly she she made a beef wellington for lunch with poisonous mushrooms in, in it and three people died, three of her guests died. And the second case, which is terribly sad, currently ongoing, is Samantha Murphy. She left for a run. She left her home in Ballarat for a run and she never came home. She's a mother and uh, someone has been charged with her kidnapping and murder but the police are looking for her, so they, ha- they, don't, they haven't found her. It's a terribly sad case. Those two last ones are in the news at the moment, so probably their future episodes. I just want to say thank you again and keep up the good work. I'm going to join as a member very shortly. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Did I tell you that Caroline was from Australia? No, but I could hear it. Beautiful accent. So those are some really good cases. I always like a good poisoning case because I think that's one of the most brutal ways to kill someone. It's not a pleasant way. Right. And it's not very like forthright or right out there. It's kind of secretive and cruel. Like that dentist that we saw in 48 Hours. And this, the ones that Caroline suggested, I think the Claremont case has been talked briefly about in feedback. That sounds familiar, yes. And the uh, backpacker murders. And I know Falcone, what we did, that was a bonus episode from a couple of years ago. Oh, so when she becomes a member, she'll be able to listen to that. Yeah. That's the one with the girlfriend? Yeah. And they yeah. decided before they got married to take a trip throughout Australia. Yeah. In their little truck that they had. Mm-hmm. Yes, that was really an interesting one. I remember that. So thanks, Caroline. Then we have just one email we're going to read today? We have two. Oh, two. Okay. I'll do the first one. Okay. Okay. This is from Valerie, and it's a case suggestion. Hi, Jill and Dick. Love you guys. I'd like to recommend a podcast about Adam Leroy Lane, a truck driver who killed at least two women along his route and attempted a third. He broke into a house in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, my hometown, and while attempting to kidnap a teenager in her bedroom, her parents were awoken and basically kicked the shit out of him. Smiley face. Even though they were both smaller built and Lane was a huge hulking beast, there is a Dateline and a 48 Hours and a book, Caught in the App, written by the mom who caught him. The reviews are mixed on the book, so not sure if you want to read it. Thank you. Keep up the good work. So Lane committed these crimes in 2007, two murders and three attempted murders, and authorities have tried to link him with other murders as well. Yeah, they're pretty sure that... He's done others. And again, this is a guy who's married, has three kids. He's been, from what I could tell, an upstanding citizen. And then he suddenly goes out and kills people and tries to kill a third person. Yeah, that's crazy. So we'll have to look into that. And the Massachusetts case where the parents uh, beat up the guy? Yeah. That just sounds so Massachusetts, right? (laughs) And many friends from Massachusetts, and they are hard asses. They are tough people. Some of the best people I've met. They were tough on this guy. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Okay, you read our last email. This is from Amy, who's written before. We like to hear from Amy. Brian Stephen Smith, who's 53 years old, was found guilty on 14 counts, including two counts of murder in the first degree for the murders of Kathleen Joe Henry and Veronica Abuchuk. They also found him guilty of sexual assault in the second degree, tampering with evidence, and misconduct involving a corpse. So homicide detectives with the Anchorage Police Department were alerted after murder when a woman shared video with them from Smith's phone. The video, along with photos found on the device, showed that Smith had tortured the then-unknown woman before killing her and disposing of her body and attempted to hide the evidence. Further investigation resulted in the victim being identified as Kathleen Jo Henry. While he was being questioned, Smith admitted to killing a second victim a year prior and that woman was identified as Veronica Abuchuk. The jury was presented with Smith's lengthy and detailed confession with investigators, as well as videos of Kathleen Joe Henry's murder and videos of Veronica Abuchuk before and after her murder. After delivering their verdicts, the jury also found Smith guilty of an aggravating factor that he had subjected Kathleen Joe Henry to substantial physical torture. That aggravating factor will subject Smith to a mandatory 99-year sentence on the murder of Henry. For Abuchuk's murder, he faces a sentence of 30 to 99 years. 
Sentencing is scheduled for July 12th and July 19th, 2024. Well, I would venture to guess that that person's never getting out of prison. From what Amy said, yeah, it doesn't sound like he's going to be doing anything other than being in prison. Right. Well, yeah, that sounds like a very interesting one to follow. Yeah, of course, we'll wait to see what he gets for a sentence. Of course, it's interesting photos and videos now with everyone having a cell phone for the last couple decades. Uh, a lot more crimes are being found out that way. Yeah. And of course, locating people by their phones and Apple Watches and all that. Well, and of course, you can't do anything these days without taking a picture of it on your iPhone. Yeah, right. So, well, I can, but some people can't. I can resist also. Right, yeah. But I think it really, for detectives, it must be a whole new learning process, technology, over the past well, several been... years. It's not the way Joe Kenda did it. It's changed, no. for sure. Oh, now you've got cameras all over the place. Yeah, which is a good thing. I mean, I'm sure it prevents a lot of crime. But thank you, Amy, for the great recommendation. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Again, if you have a chance to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, we would love that just to get us more listeners. And please send us your feedback. We do enjoy feedback. It's the best part of the show for us, at least. <laughs> it's fun. It is, absolutely. And we've gotten uh, some more people doing voicemails. Yeah, we've had a little bit of an uptick so in I've, it. So I've got even kind of a little backlog of cases I've yes. been listening to, so i got stuff to do. Okay, awesome. So thank you, everybody, again, and we'll see you next time at The Quiet End. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>